All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit more about the Cyprinidae. Uh, of course, this is a big family. We've got lots of species. That's why it's taking us um, many lectures to cover everything here. What we're going to talk about now are the non-native Cyprinids, and these are a, a big problem in fisheries here in the U.S., and so we really need to address that. So um, first off, I'm going to start with a, just an interesting non-native. This is called the doctor fish, Gararufa. And these are, I can't really say that these are a big problem right now. It's just interesting. It's a new trend. Um, these fish are like, they, they clean ectoparasites off of other fish, or they like to eat, eat scales, or I don't know exactly what they do in their native uh, range, but they can be used, uh, there's a new trend where they're used for pedicures. And so you stick your feet in the water and the fish come and just eat all the dead skin off. And um, uh, that's pretty interesting, but it's, it was actually um, starting to become popular, but there's a lot of concern that, well, if we allow people to bring these fish in, they're just going to release them and we're just going to have one more invasive. So they have been outlawed. They are no longer legal in the U.S., um, but it's just interesting. So uh, I there are some several videos showing this. I put a link on the Canvas page for you to check out to see the Dr. Fish in action. Now, talk about something that is a problem and that we're going to have to deal with. We talk about the carp. And so these are the largest minnows. And here in the U.S., all carp are exotic. There are no native carp to the U.S. And the biggest one, the biggest problem that's been here for the longest time is the common carp. The common carp are all over the U.S., and that's because we put them there. So this is probably the most widely cultured fish in the world. It's very popular. It's been cultured for thousands of years. And when Europeans uh, came over to the United States, they were familiar with this fish, and so they wanted to bring it with them. And so this fish was stocked all over the United States. Uh, they made special rail cars with, that could hold water and hold fish, and whenever the rivers would um, flood, they'd go into the, the backwaters after the, the, the river had receded, and they'd sane up carp and transfer them. So they purposely moved them all over the country. Of course, this was in the 1800s. It was long before we thought at all about invasive species and their effect. So that's why they are everywhere. And... They don't get a lot of press these days relative to the other carps, probably because we're just used to them. But they are a big problem, and, they, and they're very bad for the ecosystem. They're omnivores, and the way they feed is by rooting around in the sediment. And so they stir up the sediments and suck up invertebrates from the sediment, and that really muddies up the water. And these are a classic case of an ecosystem engineer, uh, an organism that physically modifies its own habitat, which completely changes that ecosystem. And so that's one reason why they're a big problem. If you have a wetland or a lake or something where you want to have clear water, which allows the sunlight to get in, which allows vegetation to grow, which allows the algae to photosynthesize, if the common carp gets in there, stirs it up, gets it all muddy, um, then the light can't penetrate and you shift from a clear water state to a dirty water state. And um, it's just sort of two completely different ecosystems. So, for example, in wetland restoration, this is a big deal. If the carp get in there, then you have a lot of trouble establishing wetland vegetation. Um, so they're, that's one reason why they're a big problem. They don't really have a lot of predators. And like I said, they're just part of the community now. We are not going to eradicate these. If we can, we control them. Yes, we in there are places where we're concerned about controlling them. Yes, but as far as eradication, they're established. So, one interesting thing about the common carp is that uh, to some degree they use pheromones to inhibit reproduction and inhibit to regulate reproduction and inhibit overpopulation. So when the population gets dense, the adults start to release pheromones that limits the fecundity and limits reproduction. Uh, within the population. So there's been some interest in can we use this as a way to control them? Can we mimic this pheromone and release it? Don't know if that's going anywhere. Another way that common carp can be limited is by high densities of bluegill. 
And so when you have both common carp and bluegill, if the bluegill are in high densities, bluegills are really effective egg predators, especially with common carp. And so the reproduction of the carp can be limited because the bluegills eat a bunch of their eggs. So that's pretty interesting. Now, how we're going to identify these common carp is first thing is we're going to look for a stout sawtooth spine on the dorsal and anal fin, a real heavy serrated spine. Um, that's pretty much a giveaway. On that dorsal fin, it's a very long dorsal fin, big scales. And then the carp has barbels at its mouth. Um, so this fish at first glance looks like a couple other fish. It looks a little bit like a buffalo, looks a little bit like a goldfish. Um, and it's because of the big scales and the long dorsal fin. But if we look at that dorsal fin, we find that that one and the anal fin have a very stout sawtooth spine, which something like a buffalo wouldn't have. And here's what that spine looks like, and it's very strong. And if you've ever been electrofishing and you've dip netted carp, you know that this thing will drive you crazy because it hangs up on your net. It's very hard to get the fish out. Um, and like I said, these look a lot like goldfish too, but they're easy to identify from a goldfish because if you look, the common carp has barbels at the corners of its mouth. And so if you've got barbels, you've got a common carp. Now, as I mentioned, this fish is widely cultured for many, many different reasons, and it's been cultured for a long time. So consequently, you have lots of different forms. And if you look around the world, um, you can see a lot of these different forms. And so here's a great big common carp, just a typical common carp. And now you see a lot of these pictures are taken by fishermen. In other parts of the world, these are considered a prized game fish. Because they can get big, as you can see here, they put up a great fight. They're difficult, they're, they're quite a challenge. Uh, I think in England, a lot of the pubs have like fishing clubs and the pubs will fish against other pubs and um, for these carp. So they're popular as a sport fish in Europe and other countries, not here in the US. This is a leather carp, so it has no scales. This is one that is fairly common in the U.S. You're going to see these. We call these Israeli carp or mirror carp, where they have few scales, and the scales are really big. And uh, if you sample fish and sample somewhere with common carp, you will get these. They're, they're not uncommon. I mean, I have no numbers to back that up. But if I had to guess, I'd say you know maybe 5% of the carp that I've ever seen in the wild are mirror carp. This I've never seen around here, but this is a linear carp, one row of scales. And in fact, koi are actually common carp. Now, a lot of people would look at these brightly colored fish with a big fancy fin, and they would call them goldfish. And that's because they're colored like goldfish and a closely related goldfish, but these are not goldfish. The koi is actually just a fancy, you know, it's a dressed up common carp. And so, again, if you see something that's this colorful, but it has barbels, it's a carp, not a goldfish. Now, this is, brings up, there's an interesting situation with these koi. There are people that um, breed koi for show, and so they have contests. So just like you have a dog show, they have a koi show, and, you know, who's got the prettiest fins and everything. And there's this... Um, through these koi shows, it was discovered that there's something called the koi herpes virus. And it's very lethal and very contagious. And so the way they found this out is you take these kois to the show, and the way they would judge them is everybody puts their fish in the same tank, and so the judges can watch them swim around, just like the dog show. You watch the dogs run around. And then everybody takes their fish and goes home. Two weeks later, all their fish are dead because the one of the fish is infected with this koi herpes virus and it gives it to all the other ones it's sort of how this was developed or excuse me discovered anyway um it's uh pretty specific to these fish there aren't any u.s native fish that we know that that contract this particular virus and this is one another way they're looking to control the common carp in australia can they 
release this virus, genetically modify this virus to and release it so it kills just the carp and not anything else. Now I mentioned that the common carp looks a lot like a goldfish. They're very similar, they're closely related. And you will run in to goldfish in the wild out here in the US. Now when you catch them, they don't look like your pet store goldfish. They don't have those bright colors. They tend to, at least in my experience, they always lose their color and they're colored more like a common carp, that grayish brown. Why do they lose it? I don't have, I don't know. I have, I suspect it's because only the, you know, the bright ones get preyed upon very quickly, um, but probably has something to do with their diet and they're just not getting certain um, pigments in their diet. Now they look a lot like a common carp. If you're sampling, you pull them up, your first guess is going to be common carp. They've got that sawtooth spine. They've got the long dorsal fin. They've got the big scales, but they don't have the barbels. And so here's an example of one we caught in the Mississippi once. And you can see this has got the big fancy fins, the big scales, but no barbels. And here's a smaller one. Same thing. And there are reproducing populations of these all over the country. And so when you put them side by side, you can see that they are very similar fish until you look at the mouth. And you see the common carp has barbels, the goldfish does not. And I've been told that they hybridize, and when they hybridize, you can get one barbel and on, a barbel on one side and not on the other. So that could happen too. And so that's the first part of our non-native minnows. And then in the second part, we're going to talk about some of the other non-native minnows, which we call the Asian carp. And they're a big problem, so we got a lot to talk about. So that'll be in our next presentation. So I'll see you in a bit.